Jesus Christ is the most famous person ever to exist. Some love him, some hate him, and some ignore him. In this video, I will introduce him to you based upon the Holy and Sacred Bible. And this third Christian foundation clarifies the person and the work of Jesus Christ and its application to you and me. Greetings, this is Dr. Willis Newman from Newman Ministries International. Thanks for your interest, and I invite you to visit our website and our Facebook at BibleTeachingAbout.com. Our online Bible training courses can be found at NewmanBibleAcademy.org. We have over 300 free articles, e-books, paperbacks, and the question and answer section, and much, much more. The content is wisely calculated to make Jesus Christ real to your life and to help you on how to solve those problems that you might be facing. You can find the written script with the scripture verses for this lesson on our website. And I begin by presenting the person of Jesus Christ. Who is he? Well, the first of our four facts to know about Christ is his pre-existence. Christ has, has eternally always existed. He existed before he entered into this world as a man. And he is the eternal Son of God the Father. And the Apostle John said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's in John 1, verse 1. And the Word is identified as Jesus in the verse 14. To put it another way, John was saying that Jesus is just as old as the Father, who is eternal. And John said that Jesus Christ is the creator of all, and that the life itself is sourced in him. And amazing statements these are. In another place, Christ himself said he was the mighty I am, the self-existent one, or the Jehovah of the Old Testament, thus claiming equality with God. Now the second fact is Christ's incarnation. John wrote, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, in John 1.14. This means that the second member of the Trinity was born in a normal human body from a normal human mother who was a virgin, but where there was not a human father. So God was the Father. The Holy Spirit conceived the sinless human nature of Christ. And we... The result is that Christ is fully God, fully perfect man, and eternally united in one person. Now, when Christ came into the world, John said he dwelt among men. That is, he took upon himself a human nature. And in that new arrangement became the only begotten, which refers to his unique, only one of his kind relationship with God the Father. Now, Christ was not just another creature made by God, because Christ is the eternal Son of the one eternal Father, who at his incarnation became the firstborn of a new race of humanity. Now the third grand fact refers to Christ's divinity. Jesus Christ is God. The Bible assigns to Christ divine characteristics, works, names, and even honor. For example, Doubting Thomas was a devout Jew who would never worship a false god. And when he saw Jesus after his resurrection from the dead, he addressed Christ, my Lord and my God. So Christ commended him, Thomas for that act of worship. So scripture in many places calls Christ God. A list is available on our website. And Christ said that he and God the Father were one, that they shared a common nature. Christ even claimed to be greater than the temple, the Jewish Sabbath, and even the Old Testament itself. One excellent way to be clear on the person of Christ is to examine Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 10. That section is talking about the God of the Old Testament, naming him ten times in ten verses. Three names for God are used, Elohim, and Adonai, and Yahweh, or Jehovah. Now, Look carefully with me and note Isaiah verse 3. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Both the words Yahweh and Elohim are used as the names of the God of the Old Testament. Now why is that important? Well, if you turn to Mark 1 verses 1 through 3, you will see that the God of the Old Testament is identified as being none other than Jesus Christ himself. Indeed, Jesus Christ is the God, not a God, mind you, but the God, 
of all that exists or ever has existed. The fourth fact of Jesus Christ is his humanity. Christ has all the essentials of human nature, the body, the soul, the spirit, and he had human names. Christ had the marks of personality, he had emotions. He had bodily characteristics in that he became weary and slept. He looked, acted, and was recognized as a man. He even prayed. I bring you now to this all-important question. What do you think of Jesus Christ? What about those amazing claims concerning the person of Christ? His claims cannot be brushed off like a pesky mosquito on a hot human night. Neither was Christ just a good man, a teacher, a religious leader, or a prophet. The Jesus of the Bible is not a created being of God <clears throat> or a spirit being elevated in a hierarchy above other beings. Neither is he the creation of the church fathers who invented some stories about Christ and put them in the Bible. His claims and his works were far too dramatic and important. No other person in history has made the claims or done the deeds as those of Christ. None. He claimed to be the very God with the power to forgive sins and to assign people to heaven or to hell. He had power over nature and death, and Christ was put to death for his claims. He rose from the dead. Powerful stuff. We have only three choices about Christ. He was either a liar, a raving lunatic, or he was who he claimed to be. Well then, was he a liar? No, because a liar would not voluntarily go to his death for what he knew were lies. Was he insane? No, a crazy man who made the claims he did and could not gain a following. And remember, over 3,000 people were converted at the first Christian sermon. Uh, following his death and his resurrection. And really, a crazy man or a liar could not perform the miracles that he did. That leaves us with one conclusion. Christ is God himself. Question, who do you think that Jesus Christ is? Consider that question as we turn to the work of Christ. What was the work of Christ? Specifically, I describe his atonement, his resurrection, ascension, his future ministry, and how to receive Christ as your salvation. And under atonement, I also introduce the magnificent truths of his substitution for our sins and our reconciliation to God through Christ. All are good news, so don't go away. Now, what is Christ's atonement or his sacrificial work on the cross? Here's the problem. God is a holy God. The angels of the heavens said of God, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The maximum emphasis is God's holiness. It is the standard that guides His love, His mercy, and His grace, His holiness, and His demands, perfection, and punishes everything that violates His standard. Everything. Adam and Eve sinned against God and became guilty. They disobeyed and they broke His law. Consequently, they were placed under everlasting condemnation, which means separation from God, and banished to a place in hell and his fiery punishment. Now, oh, that's a horrible predicament. And the problem becomes very personal in that while Adam passed his sin nature on to us, his children, and the result is that you and I are sinners along with the same punishment as Adam and Eve. Adam's sin and guilt was transferred to us. His disease became ours. We're hopeless. We're undone. Powerless. In our sin, we can never approach the Holy God. Never. And the Bible says that before God, all humanity is helpless, ungodly, unrighteous, guilty, sinners, and enemies under the wrath of God. It is impossible to earn God's favor by being good, religious, or any other means. It's impossible. Is there any escape? Well, fortunately, yes. And here it is. The solution. Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. That's great. Motivated by his perfect love, God put a solution into motion. Christ came to suffer and die in our place, and that was the purpose of his incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection. And when we're going on a trip somewhere, we go with a purpose, maybe to see relatives get a job or go to school, but we go with a purpose. So Christ came into the world to pay the penalty for our sin, and only he could do that because he's God, which gave him the value. 
Now, secondly, he is perfect, sinless man, so he could identify with the human race and become our substitute. Substitution is one important idea in that atonement of Christ. Man could only pay for his own sin by suffering the penalty for all eternity. But God, in his great love, appointed a substitute to take our place, and that substitute was Christ. His suffering and death was enough payment to bring eternal salvation for everyone who personally accepts him as their Savior. You know, in basketball, for example, when a player gets tired, a substitute is sent in to replace him or her. Likewise, Christ became our substitute, and in his suffering, God's wrath and righteous demands were fully satisfied. Two, two great transactions took place in this event. Our eternal guilt was transferred to Christ as in eternal righteousness was transferred to sinners who come to Christ for salvation. Hallelujah! What a Savior! And how can you turn away from a deal like that? Take Christ as your Savior quickly. Reconciliation is a second amazing fact tied to Christ's atonement. Mankind has greatly offended God like a husband or wife unfaithful to their spouse. And the problem is, how can we repair the breach? Because we become God's enemies and objects of his deserved wrath. Read Romans chapter 5. And the brilliant fact is that God took the initiative and through Christ alone we may be reconciled to him. Our good works, our persuasion speech, our piles of money, our vigorous religious activity, or our station in life will not reconcile us to God. Only through Jesus Christ may we approach God. And in Christ alone we have passed out of the domain of darkness and death and eternal judgment into the light, the life, the forgiveness, and eternal hope and life. Now another astonishing fact of Christ's work was his resurrection from the dead. On that glorious day almost 2,000 years ago, Christ came out of the grave. His resurrection was not just a spirit that appeared, nor was the body stolen, because Christ arose in the same body that was put into the grave, a physical, genuine, identifiable body. It was glorified and the tomb was empty. Christ appeared to over 500 people at one time and many others on many occasions, and over 3,000 people were converted to Christ just a few weeks after his resurrection. And the resurrection of Christ was Peter's central theme in that very first Christian sermon. My e-book, you can believe the Bible, gives many proofs of Christ's resurrection. And you can find it on Amazon or on our website, BibleTeachingAbout.com. Now another enormous fact of Christ's work was his ascension into heaven. After Christ spent 40 days on the earth after his resurrection, his earthly ministry was completed. He went up into heaven and he began his present ministry. And he was exalted by the Father to be above all creation. And he is our high priest who ministers to us daily. He prays on our behalf. He answers our prayers. He is preparing for us a place in heaven. And he is building his church here on earth. He is giving special help for our needs and he is concerned about our success in Christian work. Many places in the world there are great flocks of sheep. They graze on the beautiful grassland and the fertile meadows and the open hillsides. And they feed, they grow, and they multiply, but always under the careful, watching eyes of a shepherd. He leads them to green pastures, tenderly cares for them, and watches out for danger. And we're like sheep, and Jesus is our good shepherd very greatly involved in our lives. He is concerned, compassionate, caring, and corrective. Now I come to the fourth fact of Christ, his future ministry. I give more details in another lesson, but now I can say that he is physically coming back to this world. And there is a specific sequence to his return. He will take his church out of this world first, and second, he will judge the world during a horrible seven-year tribulation. Third, he will return to rule the world. When will Christ return? No one knows. Not the angels in heaven or even the devil himself knows the date of Christ's return. And many people have tried to predict the return of Christ, but they were wrong and humiliated. The final fact we can say about the person and the work of Christ is this. How can we receive this wonderful salvation? 
the New Testament gives us the secret over 200 times. The Philippian jailer asked the Apostle Paul the question, What must I do to be saved? And Paul told him, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. John said that as many as receive Christ would be saved. And he said salvation was not based upon what social class we were born into or any decision by any man or woman or by our hard efforts. Salvation is received by faith. What an ingenious plan by God. Faith makes everyone equal. It was based on being, if it was based on being an important person, wealth, rank in society, intelligence, abilities, and some would have more advantage than others. But anyone can trust or believe or have faith in Christ. Kings, nobles, pastors, deacons, sailors, or farmers are all equal before God when it comes to salvation. But that access is only through Jesus Christ. Now what does it mean to trust in Christ? Well, let me give you an example. Let's say you wanted to take a boat trip in a lake, a river, or an ocean. You walk down to the wharf and find two boats that offer to carry you to your destination. And the water is rough, and the wind is blowing, and you look at one boat, but it has an old rotten hull, wooden hull with several large holes right at the water line, to, no pump to pump the water out, the engine sputters badly, and the captain and the crew have never even been on a boat before. We'll name that boat the works boat. Now look at the second boat. It's nearly new, with a strong, freshly planted painted steel hull, two new diesel engines that run smooth as silk, a pumping system that works perfectly, and an experienced captain and crew. We call that boat the Faith in Christ boat. Now, you must make a decision. If you decide to take the words boat, undoubtedly you will either get lost or sink into the water. And so it is when we try to trust in our good works, baptism, or church membership, or religion, or status in society, or because we have a family and perhaps our parents are Christians, or whatever it is that we're trusting in, to get us to heaven. And we cannot get to heaven by trusting in these things, just as we will never get to our destination in the works boat. Now, if you choose to board the Faith in Christ boat, you will get to your destination, no problem. And in the same way, if you trust in Christ alone to save you, then you are certain to get to heaven. Now, how can we be sure? Well, because Christ said that we will be saved, and we can trust his word. It doesn't depend on your feelings, but on your faith. Feelings follows faith. Now I come to a third choice that many people make. They trust both in Christ and in their good works. Isn't that okay? Well, let me put it this way. What will happen if you decide to take both the works and the faith boat at the same time? Try putting one foot in one boat and the other foot in the other boat. What will happen? Well, when you hit the first wave, you're going to fall into the deep water because it's impossible to stay in both boats, boats at the same time. You must get into one or another. We must make up our minds. It is the same with Christ and works. We cannot have both. They are mutually exclusive. So choose Christ today quickly. And with this I conclude our study on the person and the work of Christ and its application to us. And the sacred Bible taught that Christ is fully God and fully man. Regarding his work, we study his atonement, substitution, reconciliation, resurrection, ascension, future ministry, and his return. So I close with this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So I invite you now to go to our website for the written script of this lesson with all the Bible verses. Browse through the many free articles and affordable books. And the books have been priced very low, and the contents are easy to understand. We use them in our Bible colleges around the world. And we offer them to help you thrive in your Christian life. Just go to our website and click on the section ebooks and bookstore, BibleTeachingAbout.com. And since this is a Christian ministry, we also ask for your prayer and your financial support. So until next time, may God richly bless you.